Welcome to Fellowship Safaris, conversations about people of color and their journeys to subspecialist training in their countries of origin and around the world. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Fellowship Safaris podcast. My name is Dr. Jerry Kariajahe, and I am super excited for today's conversation. I would want to describe my next guest as Wonder Woman. I know she's like, look at me, my brows are going up, but I'll tell you why. Because as I was preparing to have this conversation, I came across some numbers and I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk more about what the journey has been to get to some of these numbers. So in Kenya, we found that the surgical workforce stands at 1.21 per 100,000 population. And when we say surgical workforce, I'm meaning all the surgeons not just the specialists. The other thing that I found to be quite interesting is that while over 50% of the global population is women, less than 20% of the clinicians, especially in the surgical space who take care of them, are female. And so that's why I'm calling my next guest Wonder Woman, because I think in my humble opinion, that her story is one that's really, really inspiring and also one that we can learn a lot from. And so I'd like to welcome Dr. Karen Babu. Karibusana. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that <laughs> warm welcome. <laughs> yes. So uh, as we're getting started, could you let us know what you do for a living and what area you did a fellowship in? So my name is Karen Babu. I am an oncoplastic breast surgeon. I'm also a general surgeon. So basically, I take care of ladies who have breast disease. We plan their surgery. I execute the surgery. And I also take care of uh, other conditions that might not necessarily need uh, surgery. So that's what I do on a daily. Most of my patients are women. So I'm very fortunate to be in that field for yeah. many reasons. Yes. Wow. That is so amazing. So just taking you a few steps back, how did your journey start in terms of thinking about medicine as a whole? Well, I think I always sort of knew from an early age, I'm more of a nurturer and um, I like action-oriented tasks. I think I knew very early that I was going to be in some humanities field, which narrowed down to, at some point, wanting to be a vet. And I actually almost went and did vet med in <laughs> med school. But uh, increasingly, I think it's more of the interaction with, with people that I really thrive. I also felt like I wasn't maybe clever enough, <laughs> quotes and quotes, for internal medicine, because those guys are brainiacs. So I found myself also being inspired a lot by surgeons who had gone before me. I think in third year of medical school, I already knew I was going to do general surgery just because of some interactions with a lot of our tutors. Mm -hmm. They were very passionate about their craft. Uh, surgery is a very rewarding field. You mm -hmm. can actually see the results of your work. Uh, sometimes it's also humbling because you would do the best surgery or the best procedure you know, mm -hmm. but something else will happen that's beyond your control. Yeah. So it keeps you grounded, but at the same time, it's the ability of your hands, your brains all working together for you to execute something so that the patient can feel better. Yeah. I think that in a nutshell is why <laughs> I do what I do. Yeah. Yes. And it's so interesting that you characterize yourself as a nurturer and somebody who really interacts more with people. Thank you that you interact more with people. We would have lost you to vet med. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> Although I feel like I missed <laughs> when I take my dogs to the vet. I'm like, oh my goodness, that could have been me. That like, could have been you. <laughs> hugging multiple dogs a day. <laughs> oh my gosh. All the fuzzy feelings. Oh, but yeah. then yeah. I'm really, really glad that then you uh, moved towards medical school. And it's interesting that by third year, you'd already started seeing that this is the thing that you want to do. Is there a particular person or a particular conversation that sticks out in your mind that made you think, this is it for me, this is what I want to do? 
Yeah, I mean, I think maybe two sentinel conversations. So one was actually, interestingly, from an, a urologist, a man, okay. <laughs> who happened to be a lecturer in uh, our undergrad. I'm sure we both know him. Yeah. And he's probably the most unlikely of people to inspire somebody because he's relatively old school, but also, again, very passionate about his craft. And when he was talking to us about, I think it was hernias. So mm. this is a topic about uh, abdominal wall surgeries that everyone has to, sometimes struggles to understand. Mm. But I think he presented it in such a clear fashion and um, the interventions that one has to do based on the knowledge about what's going wrong and how you can fix it and how you can not fix it. And and I think that I was really drawn to that particular aspect of medicine. Mm-hmm. And then the second one is when I was talking to one of our lady female surgeons. She's one of the, I think she's the second female surgeon in this country. And she's also very humble, but um, trailblazer, like we always look up to her. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can say her name. It's Dr. Lois Cajoro. Absolutely. An amazing lady. She probably would not remember this conversation because she gets approached numerous times. Mm -hmm. And also in, I think around third year, we were doing a clinic and I was just looking at her. I'm like, Dr. Cajoro, how have you done it? Like you're a lady, you're so passionate, you're so good, you Mm -hmm. hold leadership positions, you do excellent work surgically. You're, you know, a family person. So, you know, all that for me seemed yeah. so incomprehensible. How yes. can you do it? And she told me, you know what, you just do it because you prioritize and God puts you in certain positions mm. for a reason. So those are the two people who definitely were yeah. in the darkest of nights of, you know, trying to understand surgical pathology. You yeah. kind of always think about those two people. So oh. I'm really grateful about that. Oh, wow. Shout out to both of them. <laughs> who was the urologist? <laughs> It was actually Professor Ndaguatha. Oh, shout <laughs> Again, out. I, I don't know if he would remember it, but he did uh, an excellent job when he was training undergraduates. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaharo, and also Prof Ndaguatha. You see these conversations that you may not be thinking much about have had such a huge, huge ripple effect and impact, and we want to give you your flowers. If you get to listen to the podcast, I absolutely love that, and that that early you were able to have those kinds of conversations. So fast forward, just given the different conversations that people have about specialties and what you're going to focus on, how did you eventually land on the subspecialty that you're in right now? So oncoplastic breast surgery actually marries two surgical specialties. So that's general surgery and plastic surgery. So people come to it differently. There are people who start off as plastic surgeons and then end up specializing in that. A majority of us, however, come from a general surgery background. And then you end up spending between one to two years mastering that aspect of breast. And traditionally, general surgeons always took care of the breast. You know, they take care of all conditions below the head, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. except bones and the heart. So it tended to be lumped amongst the categories that a general surgery is meant to be proficient in. Mm-hmm. But increasingly, I think during my residency, and especially towards my last year, I started having more interactions with women in breast cancer. At that time, we were the person or the uh, clinician I was shadowing the surgeon happened to be a breast surgeon. Mm -hmm. And so most of my time was spent in the breast clinic, appreciating the nuances of breast cancer. For example, it's not just one monolithic disease. It comes so differently, but it's almost always something that you need to have a teamwork approach. And then at the back of my head, I was drawn to plastic surgery from the reconstructive aspect of it. That's Mm -hmm. why Dr. Lois Kahoro was always such an inspiration. Mm -hmm. But somehow my journey ended up being me doing general surgery. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, at the end of that, trying to merge into something that I was interested in, which is reconstruction. Yeah. And it's actually not a new field because from the 90s, it's been a standalone specialty, especially in the UK, Europe and the like. Mm -hmm. In Kenya, it's coming into its own right now because we have a lot more options. We are slowly increasing the number of people who are in this specialty. But for me, it offered a very practical and uh, nice uh, merging of the two areas that I felt I was into. So general surgery, because it's it's really gratifying and exciting mm-hmm. to work with the human body. Mm-hmm. A little bit of the reconstructive surgery. I wouldn't say the whole gamut, but just a little bit of it. And mm-hmm. for me, I think I sit quite nicely in that little space. Yeah. yeah. And just out of curiosity, how many breast and onco reconstructive surgeons are there in the country currently? Well, we are currently counting about eight in the country. And when I say eight, it's people who've actually finished general surgery qualification and then gone ahead to do an oncoplastic recon 
certification. So we're not that many. <laughs> wow. And almost all of us are in Nairobi, except yes. uh, one of our colleagues in Kisi. Yes. So we are increasingly, of course, getting numbers because yeah. a lot more people are interested in this, like I said, gratifying. It's easier to sort of focus yourself in one field and, yeah. and become good at it, mm -hmm. which is another thing that I was drawn to. Yeah. So, yes, it's a very attractive field, but yes, we are quite a few, and the bulk of uh, breast work is being done by general surgeons and other practitioners. Mm -hmm. But through the use of different modalities like virtual MDTs, telemedicine, we're able to at least impart some skills and knowledge, and we also do outreach programs, preceptorships. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're trying our best to, you know, push the word out there that there are many, many options for breast surgery. Yeah. Eight. Like, I'm still stuck at eight. <laughs> wow. I, I think... It says a lot about how far we've come mm -hmm. because at some point yeah. it sounds like we didn't have that subspecialist in the country yeah. yet. Yeah. But then going to eight is better than zero. True. And for me, that already says in a very big way that not as many people need to travel outside to get some of these subspecialist skills yeah. and we have it here. Even though it's largely in Nairobi, yeah. I think about traveling to Nairobi versus traveling to another continent to get this surgical care yeah. is, is huge steps. So kudos to the other seven <laughs> people if you get to listen to this episode. And at the same time, it can't be I, it can't be understated just how much more we need people to to pick up the interest in this subspecialty. Mm -hmm. When you think about the training experience, how long did it take for you to study general surgery versus going into the subspecialty? How much time did that take? So I did my general surgery residency for four years. At that mm -hmm. time, it was four years. Yeah. Then I worked as a general surgeon for close to three years mm -hmm. before I went for my fellowship, which originally was meant to be two years, but then because of COVID, ended up being almost two and a half years, mm -hmm. just because a lot of the training stopped when we were there. I keep telling people, like, now I'm coming to the point of my life where half my life has been involved in studying the human body or yeah. medicine in some form or the other. Yeah. But yes, the surgical journey really, I don't think it ever stops because even when you've done fellowship and you've done all the things that you think you should do, <laughs> you still have to keep your skills going up. Like, now I'm trying to figure out which short courses I can do because increasingly you start seeing, oh, okay, well, I need to become more proficient in this mm -hmm. or I need to be able to offer this service. So that means you keep having to add more skill sets to your endless <laughs> learning, endless, endless classes. Learning. Yeah, but and it's quite interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting that you're like half your life you've already been studying medicine mm -hmm. and yet... Yeah, there's still stuff I don't know. There's still stuff <laughs> you're learning and yeah. relearning. It speaks to, especially for, I always tell younger people, like think about at least 20 years of your life where you're committed to continuously learning something. And then even after that. Yeah, yeah. It keeps, it keeps, it's building blocks and it's this dynamic specialty and area where yeah. you have to just keep applying yourself. It's not as stagnant. Yeah, yeah, for sure. When you think through the subspecialty training, where did you get the training and what was, you know, like a few highlights of you know, finally figuring out where you want to do the specialty. Maybe we'll start there. Yeah. So, of course, the journey of identifying what fellowship you want to do, I think sometimes begins in residency because already one is drawn towards some field in surgery or whatever specialty it is. Mm. And as the graduation date draws closer, you're thinking, okay, am I going to be here doing this specialty or am I going to make the leap and go into a subspecialty? Yeah. So I think timing also really is very variable because there are those who will have all their ducks lined up in a row and you're just a matter of switching institutions to continue with higher learning. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a little bit challenging because... As I was finishing my residency, I was now at the point where I was actually getting married yeah. and uh, having a baby at that point. So it was it was quite tricky maneuvering that. So luckily, I was in a job that was quite flex. No, I wouldn't say flexible, but they they were very kind to me, especially mm. for a young mom starting out. That also helped me become a little bit grounded, be uh, next to my family mm -hmm. as I'm working. And as I was thinking, I wanted to go to a place where if one has made the decision to go to a fellowship, you should be ready to invest yourself like 150% because mm -hmm. you're not going to come back and get that experience again. 
So you you would want to just give it your all. So identifying that place becomes very interesting. Yeah. You 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 want a place that you have as much hands on as possible as a trainee because that is experience you don't get when you become a consultant. Yeah. And you also want supervision because you want your skills to be world class and uh, get all the knowledge in a relatively short amount of time. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to find a place that matches all these criteria. Yeah. So a lot of research is always necessary. Yeah. And then the third thing is also going to a place because you're sacrificing your income earning for those years or that year that you're going away because you might take a pay cut or you might not be earning money. So mm-hmm. you need to figure out how you're going to survive in that time of training. Mm-hmm. So ideally you would want a place that pays you a stipend because you are a skilled person at that point. Mm-hmm. It's just that you're adding more skills and you're a trainee at some point. Yeah. So it, it it can be quite daunting because the more senior you are, the more difficult it is to accept a pay cut or now you've gone back to student life. Yeah. And I think for me, increasingly it became clear that um, there were some supported programs, supported meaning that there was supervision and there was pay, mm. uh, that were more in the UK space. So they, they have more experience in terms of uh, structuring programs. Mm. They, they have a lot of experience in terms of dealing with international students. Yeah. And during my residency, I had taken the exam for membership of Royal College of Surgeons of England. So I had mm-hmm. some interaction and some, you know, snapshot into how it is to work in the UK, although it's not equivalent to yeah. actually being there and doing the work. Yes. But it does sort of give you an eye opener. I didn't yeah. have as much exposure to the life or training in the States. Yeah. That's something perhaps in hindsight I might have considered if I did uh, the USMLE's exams a a bit earlier in my my career, but I didn't. So I think I was more focused in either UK or Europe sort of situation. Yeah. And um, I I went through this training program called Intercollegiate Surgical Training Program. Mm -hmm. It's run by the Royal College of Surgeons. Mm -hmm. And basically they match you up with a center that requires the skills that you possess Mm -hmm. as an early to middle, well, it's probably early grade surgeon who wants to acquire skills in a particular field. So you put in your application, say you want to become a vascular surgeon or you want to gain urological skills Mm -hmm. or you want to do orthopedic surgery. And they have a timeline in which you have to acquire those skills. So it's usually 24 months. So you're attached to a clinical unit that offers supervision you are actually employed by the National Health Service in the UK. Mm-hmm. So you get a pay that is commensurate to anyone else who is there at your equal grade. So mm-hmm. it's it's a salary that you can more than survive on. Yeah. And then you hopefully get the skills that you need because you have to prove, if, especially in a surgical field, yeah. you have to maintain a logbook. So that's procedural skills. You have to be able to do some academical academic things like, you know, publish a paper or write a paper, present in a conference. So yeah. there are all these targets that, you know, are supervised and you're supported in acquiring that. Yeah. And then the other thing about it is that at the end of those 24 months, then one is expected to go back to your home country mm-hmm. and uh, serve your country with the skills that you've earned. So in one way, it's win-win when it works really well. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I was very fortunate to have a really good experience through that program. Mm. So that's how I ended up in the UK. That's how you ended up in the UK. Yeah. I'll take you a couple of steps back because I have so many questions to try and unpack. When you talk about the workplace that you had been at when you were in transition, like you started your practice, you're married, you're getting a baby. When you said they were very kind to you, could you be a bit more, um, give us examples of what that kindness looked like in the workplace? Yeah. So the position that you get when you finish your master's in different institutions is either an instructor, senior registrar. Mm-hmm. So you have to do these two years under the supervision of a surgeon yeah. for them to sign you off and say, well, this person is competent, safe, and then the board gives you that specialty recognition. Right. So in that two years, you need to be in a place that you're doing enough work, but still under supervision, which yes. sometimes can be a bit uh, confusing because you feel like you're already independent. Yes. But it's good to have that sort of buffer period. Mm-hmm. So the place I landed in had an abundance of colleagues and, and senior colleagues who are used to mentoring young people. Okay. They were actually in the process of setting up a surgical training program. Mm-hmm. So I helped in that and that also gave me exposure to surgical education more, mm-hmm. something that I'm still involved in mm-hmm. at a higher level. Yeah. The administration of that hospital at that time were very uh, geared towards creating a very positive environment 
for everybody, not just new joins like me. Yeah. People were very friendly, happy to work with you. And as long as you showed consistency and, you know, you kind of learned the ropes of that institution, mm. generally your stay was very edifying. Mm-hmm. But they were particularly kind to moms. I don't know it's, I don't know what it was, but I found it very interesting. So, for example, yeah. when I was just... Um, I had just delivered and I was off. I had come back from my maternity leave mm-hmm. four months and I'm like, oh my goodness, like, <laughs> I don't know how it's going I've to be. I've left the baby at I've home. I've left the baby at home. I'm <laughs> yes. being called. I have to go and sort people out. It's surgery, yeah. so you can't really, if you, you're called, you have to go. Yes. So I was put back. I wasn't put back on the rotor, yeah. but everyone would be like, oh, just, you know what, Karen, just do this clinic and then... You know, if you really need it, we'll call you or yeah. they don't expect you. They don't even start calling you at night because they're like, oh, they used to do that to their other colleagues like nurses who had just come off mat leave. Yes. They wouldn't be put on night shift for about a year mm-hmm. because they know, you know, the mom has to be there. Yeah. And that's not something you get everywhere. They had a lactation room way before it was mandatory for yes. people to have. Yes. Generally, people are asking you, how are you doing? Yeah. How is your baby? They come and visit you. Yeah. It was very a very positive, enriching environment. You don't expect that and you don't often get that with big institutions. Yeah. But I'm quite grateful for that because it kind of solidifies your your loyalty and your, mm. you know, your willingness to do your best for, for, for people there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that was an, a good experience. I, I love the fact that they still had a human face for this surgeon. Yeah. I, mean, I think yeah. <laughs> surgeons, we get this this picture of this person who's come with the knife and cut. Oh, and so the, it's, yeah. It, so. Yeah. It, it's very interesting. There was a time I was heavily pregnant. I was mm. almost eight months pregnant. And yeah. then, you know, there was a trauma patient that came in, needed a laparotomy. My belly is like yes. massive. Yes. But you have to stand there and operate. And I was operating on the side, like, because my belly kind of like <laughs> In the way. So you are so operating. I had to like tilt myself. And then, you know, I think I think they kind of saw that, you know, the, the struggle is real here. And oh so they had to call gosh. people for like backup. Not that I couldn't do it, but yeah. they're like, yeah, you shouldn't be, you know, no one wants to no. be delivering uh, yeah. Dr. Mbabu here when she's <laughs> <laughs> trying to help someone else. She's helping someone, but prepare the, yeah. the second theater for her, yeah. herself. And then after that, I think they were like, well, I think maybe we should be doing these elective cases where you're yeah. just seated so yeah. those are just excisions and nice cases that you know so none of these and and so a lot of them took up that role of trying to really even if it was strictly not necessary yeah. they didn't have to yeah but i'm really encouraged because a lot of my senior colleagues i uh, want to mention dr ndonga yeah. dr afulo dr Aweru, they kind of put this kindness before you know, you must get your work done and you must sort everything out. Mm. So I was really encouraged by that. Okay, that yeah. that's fantastic to hear. And shout out to the people who made it doable. Because I think for a lot of women especially, the hesitation with surgery or a surgical specialty is how will I balance it with being a mom, with when I'm pregnant, when, you know, I need to be called away on something to do with family, which realistically speaking, is not always the same for our male counterparts. No, it's not. <laughs> um, and not to male bash or anything, but then the expectation is a bit different. Yeah. And I like the fact that you've painted us this picture of people who are very intentional, being mindful of the fact that they needed to create an equitable workplace. Yeah. And so a big shout out to them. You mentioned there were key things that you were looking for in the institution in the UK. What are a couple of pro tips from that that really helped you hone in? It sounds like there was a little bit of a checklist of the things that you need. But when someone is sitting in front of the computer, what are a couple of pro tips that you had that helped you really narrow down? Because sometimes the search engine just vomits everything. So what are a couple of things that people can be able to latch on to? in terms of when they're searching for some of the subspecialties, especially like in the UK. Yeah. So you really want to have, like I said, as much hands-on and as a complete immersion process as you can Mm -hmm. while in fellowship, because you have a short period of time. Yeah. You are new to the culture, so you might not necessarily get all the chances that you get here. People sometimes are not sure about how much you can do. Yeah. And that affects in terms of responsibilities and gaining skills. So you need to... Identify a place that has enough volumes. So that typically tends to be the smaller or the not big hospitals. Because, of course, people are drawn to the bigger cities, you know, like yes. London. And But with the bigger cities come challenges because all the other trainees in the world will be there as well. Mm. Now, what are you going to be fighting battles to get in and scrub in? 
with other guys who've been there for like years and years mm. or are you going to choose a relatively smaller hospital so mm. these are the hospitals that are not within big towns they are like up country and those actually are very busy hospitals mm. so yes so counterintuitively because yes. you think you want to go somewhere big where hospital, yeah the certificates patients. you know you when you finish your certificate you just shut up everyone yes. yeah? <laughs> I because went you to, went to the yeah, to the great, whatever yeah. it is yeah. but but surprisingly well in my experience yeah. sometimes you have to struggle in those hospitals because there are already so many trainees who are more senior than you and yeah. they get dibs in surgery you, you're only as good as how many cases you do how many you've assisted how many you've seen mm. so you'd rather be a place where you probably the only trainee yeah. but then you get to experience 100% of everything that your field mm-hmm. can offer and i was very lucky because i mean i didn't have this insight when i was applying it just sort of seemed to align because i knew i wanted to go a place that has enough experience so mm. you know you you want to see how many consultants are in that unit yeah so for example in breast screening units if you have a breast screening unit attached that's an advantage because you get a lot mm. more patients who come through yeah. the screening program and that's a different cohort of patients that you need to have managed skills in. Yeah. You also want to know how many cases they see. So often times in positions they will tell you we diagnose x number of cases. So there's a certain threshold that you want to be in a place that yeah. you know they see as many they patients see. as possible. So yeah. that means of course you see as many patients also. Yeah. You want to see how many other trainees are in the unit because like I said you don't want to be the you know 150th yes. <laughs> trainee joining that kind of unit. Scrambling for Yeah, space. so definitely. I mean a, a couple of my other colleagues when I met they were like oh how come you've managed to see X or do these number of procedures and mm. as we've been here a year we've not even seen them. Mm. I say it's because I was the only trainee there. Yeah. And uh, there were five consultants so basically it's kind of a dream job like you get to do everything you want yes. you just choose today I'm with consultant X I'm with consultant <sighs> Y. Wow. And and they're actually quite devoted to training so that yeah. was an added advantage so getting a place that has either track record in training yeah. they are able to support trainees because you also don't want to get stuck into a position where no one is looking out for you mm. and your issues are not being addressed if you have any. Mm. And then the other thing is what's the kind of support they have during your, your academic time there. Yeah. In terms of are they able to fund some courses, some extra courses? It's kind of in the small print, but yeah. all the trainees in the UK for example are entitled to a certain amount of money in terms of attending conferences. Okay. Does that apply to you? Because mm. remember you're there on a salary, maybe yeah. on a certain time to it. So the more help you can get in attending conferences, yeah. courses, the yeah. better for you. Okay. And then most importantly is trying to identify people who've been through that particular institution yeah. or in a similar situation, yeah. how how it was. So someone of a similar background and then you ask, okay, so how was this for you? How was this for you? Mm. And so a couple of my colleagues we've managed to interact and they've also made decisions to proceed in the same journey. They've been also quite fortunate and, you know, brilliant enough to be accepted in some of those programs because yeah. at least we had some background to tell them, okay, you do this yeah. apply for this think about this other program mm-hmm. yeah it's it's so interesting to hear about these different pro tips which is very different from peds because our exposure is very different our hands on versus like the surgical hands on is very very different mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i love the fact that these pro tips are also applicable when you're doing the interview process you know yeah. when you're asked do you have questions exactly the other thing i absolutely love is that as a community of surgeons that you guys share information and you're able to point each other in the right direction which is not always commonplace there are some areas people are very mm-hmm. stingy with information for lack of a yeah. kinder word yeah. is there a place where you can get all these people i mean to be fair i don't know if everyone shares information <laughs> as freely as uh, yeah. may, may, maybe maybe some of us but yeah. for sure there are a growing numbers of shall we say returnees people who've done their fellowships elsewhere mm. for us people who went to the UK we do have a whatsapp community kenyan doctors in the UK mm-hmm. very 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 useful group to join because yeah. they talk about uh, lots of things that are relevant that you wouldn't experience or have any insight into yeah. when you're here as a kenyan yeah. until you go there or as your preparing for these various entry examinations so they've done a brilliant job and maybe I can just mention Dr Stephanie Dr uh, Francis Kidai mm-hmm. Dr Omar Tayari Dr Wickliffe uh, Bagaya so all these yeah. colleagues very kindly put 
a couple of resources oh, wow. to help people to make something, a, dis- a small decision as, okay, when you get to the UK, how do you open a bank account? Because you'll realize that that is an essential. You can't yes. do anything without opening without a bank account. Without a bank account, account yes. And then to get a, that bank account, you have yeah. to have an address. So how do you get an address? How do you mm. get the right to rent? The, it's, yeah. it's like a whole rabbit hole thing. Uh, yeah. Shout out to all these doctors that you've mentioned. Yeah. It's not the easiest thing to be at a place where you're just like, let's put all this information together. Let's put all the people under one you know, group and yeah. constantly share yeah. information. So a big shout out to them. I really hope they'll get to listen to the podcast. So this is, please, perenni flowers. (laughs) Get all your flowers now. And so moving from this whole application process and narrowing down, what were two or three highlights of your training when you were in there that stick out? Well, like I said, I was extremely fortunate to be in a unit that was, number one, just starting its training program. So I was the first trainee, which would be a daunting place to join, but they were excellent clinicians. They Mm -hmm. were very skilled in academic and clinical training. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, they really wanted the first trainee to have a good experience so that at least they can continue that program in their hospital. Mm -hmm. Because remember, having a fellowship training opportunity in a hospital is like a feather in their cap. They can say that, yes, we are skilled enough to turn out future breast surgeons. So they were very, very committed. They gave me a lot of opportunities that I would otherwise not have gotten in other institutions. I had the privilege of working with at least five very senior breasts and oncoplastic surgeons and general surgeons, Mm -hmm. most of whom are leaders in in their field, in their individual rights. Mm -hmm. Um, They they were also very supportive in other skills that I felt I needed to acquire. So while Mm -hmm. I was there, I also managed to do um, a course in breast ultrasound, uh, which is an adjacent thing. It's like these extra things that you see there, then you're like, oh. So I saw a couple of my bosses doing it and I said, well, I need to be able to do my own breast ultrasounds and interventions. So you have to join um, a university, get that training, get that qualification. And I also enrolled for an online master's. Yeah. So that's a second master's while I was wow. there, just for the academic bit, which yeah. I'm, I'm actually still doing. <laughs> what is the master's in, if you don't mind my asking? Oh, it's a, it's a specialist master's in oncoplastic breast surgery. It sounds counterintuitive, wow. but <laughs> yes. so what I did was a fellowship. So that's mostly a workplace training. Yes. But the academic bits of it, you know, to enable you to be able to teach or to be able to publish papers is honed more if you have a master's like what we do in universities. Yeah. So while I was there, I mean, my bosses expect me to know, yes, the skills which you build on uh, the more you interact with them. Yes. But also the learning part of it is, okay. they'll ask you the decision to offer this therapy versus another type of surgery is based Mm, on what? So you have to be able to quote papers, be familiar with ongoing trials and their findings, participate in trials because those institutions, even where I was, they were trial centers. So of course, having an academic angle really, really is essential. Mm, mm. So I was able to join that and they supported me in that process. And uh, towards the end, I also joined a surgical leadership program under Harvard. Yes. (laughs) That was a bit extra of... (laughs) Of me, but yeah, you yeah. know, go hard or go home. Yes. So, so yes, they 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 also helped me uh, do the application. They they supported me. I applied yeah. for a bursary and I got that. So through that surgical leadership training program, because yes. I was like I was knowing and when I'm coming back to Kenya, yes. the sky's the limit for me. Yes. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> so I was able to also experience another side of surgery that not necessarily is trained mm-hmm. uh, is offered in training programs. Oh, so what so is that surgical leadership? So surgical leadership. So this was a certificate course, like a one year certificate course. Yeah. It was offered. Uh, it's offered by Harvard um, uh, Medical School. So they basically expose you to decision making and uh, other aspects of being a surgeon, either in a department, a department of surgery, mm-hmm. in a university training uh, scenario, and, and exposing you to things that are very, very anti-surgeon. So, for example, if you're told to assess the financial, uh, you know, uh, health of an institution, you begin yes. with a department, then you're told, okay, now look at this profit and loss statement and tell us what decisions should we be making. The surgeon will be like, just show me where the OR is. <laughs> where is the I OR? Just where do I cut? <laughs> yes. But a lot of these decisions, we also need to take yeah. part of them. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we end up also being shortchanged and not being able to offer the care that we are trained to do. Yeah. And then the other thing is just being, you know, aware of these corporate decisions and so, so-called so corporate speak that yes. evades us because you're from the beginning of medical school, surgical training. You have tunnel vision. You have to acquire these skills. You have mm. to do this. So you don't necessarily interact with people who are not uh, medics. Yeah. And having a lot of these exposures and networks really, really can uh, elevate your practice. Maybe yes. not just your practice, your 
uh, department, your mm-hmm. trainees, to levels you might never have actually been exposed to before. Yeah. So it's more about the networks and, and the skills, yes. decision making, which comes naturally to most surgeons, yeah. but in terms of uh, on a global scale. So mm. uh, on that in that program, I was actually very, very fortunate to meet a lot of people who in my life, I might not have met he- heads of departments, authors of very famous books, yeah. uh, people who've done like amazing things in non-medical fields, but yeah. they come and teach that course. So wow. you kind of, you know, get a lot of exposure in that. Yeah. It's so impressive to hear about all these other things that you're going, picking up skills because you're like, yeah, I'm going back home. I'm going to make a difference in my community and in my country. And we are so fortunate to be able to have you having come back with all that skill to be able to not only practice, but also to be able to teach. And while those sound really, really amazing, are there some lows that you experienced during fellowship? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're all human at the end of it. Part of my training took place in COVID. And I don't know if you recall, but Europe and the UK was really, really hit hard. So in our hospital, we even had to sort of seize all training. Those were the directors at that time. All Mm. training stopped. And all of us were deployed into other non surgical area. So mm. like, for example, I was in the medical unit, mm-hmm. you know, the um, infectious disease unit, wow. and you were seeing lots and lots of things that you never, ever expected to see mm-hmm. in your lifetime. Mm-hmm. That was um, that was really a low point because the, the fatalities there were, were a lot more than maybe in Kenya yeah. we experienced because every day you come home from work and that time not, not much was known. You mm. would just go to work pray that you don't bring something back to your family. Yeah. But at the same time, you go and you see so much death, so much sickness, mm. and you say, wow, at home, how are they? Yes. You're always calling and finding out. Yeah. What do you mean you're out in the streets? Can you what just do, go back in and like... What do you mean you're not wearing masks? Yeah, what, what do you, do you mean, mean you've gone for a family because get you're, together? Yeah, you're seeing the worst out of it, but yes. then it's not necessarily reflected there. So that yeah. was a that was a low yeah. point. It was actually very challenging to maintain sanity when you see so much loss yeah. and death. Yeah, because we are human and we empathize and you see this could be your even if it's someone who's there alone, Mm. they don't look like me, Mm. but it could very easily be your mom who's there alone, confused, very sick. Mm. But unfortunately, they don't make it. So that was quite challenging. Also, it's not easy moving your whole family into a new culture. Yeah, that was the thing. I was just like, (laughs) did she just say with my family? Yes. So, wow. uh, yeah, I was fortunate to go with my husband and my yeah. child. Yeah. So my son at that time was three years when we were going. Wow. It was an eye-opening experience, both as a person, uh, yeah. you know, individually and also as a family. Yeah. The spouse of the person doing the fellowship has to put their own things aside for the period of time. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you have experience of that. <laughs> it, it takes yes. it takes a lot. Yeah. And shout out to the spouses who do that. A shout out. <laughs> to shout the male out. spouses because <laughs> they, they, they really they really sacrifice a lot. So basically you tell yeah. them you put your things on pause so yes. that now you can come and support our family while I do this thing. So how was that conversation with your husband? Like prior to like uh, you know there's the conversation which sounds very doable. Yeah, on, on paper, paper. Sounds very easy, eh? <laughs> very easy, as in, yeah, we'll just go. You yeah. Stop what you regularly do. Yeah, then just come. And then just come. We don't know how it's going to be, but I know myself how it's going to be because nayo, I nayo. have like a contract, but whoever could you Could you So, how was that conversation? Is 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 your husband in the medical field to begin with? No, he's not. He's in IT. Okay. Very good at his field. Yes. The conversation was not easy. I think yeah. it, it happened in bits, starts, mm. pieces. Because things had to sort of align, started yeah. a long time ago, Yeah. before even like the whole process of applying or even thinking of applying. Because mm-hmm. I, I knew at some point I have to do something more about my general surgery for me to be where I feel I need to be Yeah. in terms of offering surgery. Mm-hmm. And that meant I needed to go somewhere outside Kenya because none of that was being offered in Kenya at the time. Yeah. I was very unhappy to leave my family. Yeah. Like for me, it was, a you know... A, a deal breaker. If I can't go with them, then unfortunately I might have to sacrifice that thing. Yeah. And I think that's a, a very common decision with some of our colleagues. We have to come to that point of saying, okay, do I leave my people or do I go ahead with them? Yeah. It's different strokes for different folks. Yeah. None of us had any experience, but somehow things sort of aligned. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of sacrifice and soul searching and praying and all yeah. that. Yeah. Because he is self-employed. Yeah. And going to the UK doesn't necessarily mean that you transfer the same experience you have 
and get an equivalent job there that's actually it's, repeat that I don't one know if again it's never it's unheard of almost because yeah. you can be a super super experienced person here right. in your field hr accounting business management whatever and your you know people are chasing after you to give you jobs but the minute you land somewhere where they've never heard of mwangi or Kamau or the Ambor, yeah? so they'll be like, yes. uh, these qualifications don't mean much to us. So yeah. you either Great you did them, but either, um, no thanks. You have to now start talking our language, and need. it takes a lot. Yeah. So some people, you know, they have to make decisions that are um, specific for their family. Mm. So either one person is the you know caretaker of the family if you go with your kids, yeah. and the other person is the one doing the you know the job, the professional yeah. job that you're there for, mm-hmm. or both of you are doing your professional capacity jobs although it tends to be quite difficult because childcare is a huge thing in the UK. Yeah. Very expensive and sometimes difficult to coordinate mm-hmm. with two full-time jobs. Yes. So it it does take a lot. To this mm-hmm. day I really don't know how we got to that point where <laughs> where uh, yes. my husband and my son were getting on the plane to join me but I was yeah. very fortunate that those conversations aligned. Because yeah. the other thing that you can you know talk about as a family is that it is another way of life for your child or your person because mm-hmm. you know for the time that you're there you experience this is life in the UK this is yeah. life in the US yeah. and it always adds to their world view mm-hmm. because hopefully you're making a decision to come back home yeah when you come back home you're maybe more different or you look at things differently that experience is always worth it in my humble opinion yes. it's always worth it <laughs> yeah but it does come with sacrifices because one person's development stops if they accompany you yeah. literally for that period that yeah. you're there sometimes you're living like definitely like Hand to, to, mouth. to the budget like yeah, there's no room for luxury or things like that you kind of take for granted things in Kenya for example that you experience differently there yeah so we were culture shocked <laughs> some things you have to pay a tv license fee for example you could even be arrested if you've not paid a TV license which is like to significant TV license to, to watch own TV and watch TV ah. yeah so we were like uh shelling money because you have a TV and and it's actually like an offense what? for you not to have the license you have yeah. to renew it earlier things like food budget there's heating bills sometimes can get crazy you know the ability to live in certain areas you have to consider which school is the child going to go to so mm-hmm. you have to live in those areas which might necessarily yeah. not be the cheapest yes how are you going to get around buying yeah. a car should you buy a car so while we were there we didn't <laughs> buy a car because we were fortunate enough to be like Two minutes. We were living in the hospital accommodation. So yes. So you're quite near. Yeah, near the, the hospital, hospital, near my son's school, walking yeah. distance. But at the same time, it kind of limits you because we didn't get to travel as much. Yeah. Uh, although that you know things like the transport facilities are really excellent. So uh, wins and uh, you know some learning points, but yeah. overall it was an interesting experience. Yeah. For my family, and I'm really fortunate that we got to experience that together. Together. Yeah. What are some of the things that you did to help out in terms of your mental health? Yeah. You're having to balance different roles. You've had to put pause on what you're supposed to be learning. Mm-hmm. And you are walking into the furnace quite yeah. literally every yeah. day. So yeah. what are some of the things that you did that helped your mental health during that time? So a lot of it was <laughs> spending time with my family when sometimes you want to like, you know, just be away from them because <laughs> yeah so so a lot of the time when you're there together it mm. even if you're not doing much so my husband is very good with our son like they got to bond a lot so yeah. uh, James my husband and George my son they were always like together to this day yeah he's like they're like this oh BFFs <laughs> yes. like Chanda da Pete yeah. that's another experience that they got to experience mm. um so of course spending time with them because you know at the end of the day when it's a really intense time you've been in surgery standing for like 7 hours and you have to be like it's not seven, the 7th hour is when you're fading no you have to be like on your toes on. all through yeah and then you come home it, it's such a relief to just come home and just sit down mm-hmm. and even if you have duties at home as well it's yeah. just knowing that whatever happened outside when i come home i'm mama george or i'm yeah. james wife or something yeah. like that yeah. so that's always to me i found that very very comforting The other thing that I took up and I still do is physical exercise. Yeah. So I guess it's more for the stamina because if you're having to stand and do very 
physical things, your body has to be up to task. Yeah. You may not have the typical, you know, athlete body yes. appearance, but I, I like to do things that challenge uh, my health. Yeah. So I, I really probably did a lot more in terms of taking up running. I used to go to the gym a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to practice yoga with my son. That's another thing like we started doing. Yeah. So that really helped because sometimes you can get so in your head and really worked up, but then yeah. you just say, okay, I'll just go for a bike ride. And then when you're out there, you're like, actually, it's not too bad. Yes. Like, I'm healthy. For sure. Uh, yes, I'm cycling. Yes. Um, I've got my own bike. I've yes. got, you know, so it starts kind of becoming a little less intense. Yeah. The other thing is also sort of taking time to yourself. Yeah. I'm very much a morning person. Yes. So when I wake up in the morning, I used to try and you just spend time with me and the coffee. Mm-hmm. Just not necessarily doing a whole gratitude journal. I tried. Sometimes I could do it, uh, yeah. you know, very studiously. But at some point, just being able to two or three minutes, read something that makes you feel uplifted. You yeah. can play your, I used to play this pump up jam, like, you know, yeah. in the bathroom. You're like, yeah, today's my day. Yeah, I'm going to do it. <laughs> me and my <laughs> seven, eight hours. <laughs> yeah. Let's do this. Yeah. yeah. So so small things like that. Yeah. I think also I started taking interest in things that might not necessarily be my skill set. Mm-hmm. So knitting, I started knitting just for a... Okay. I, I'm not the best. Like, I just have... I need something to do with my hands while yes. talking. Yeah. So I took that up. I, I still do it. Uh, yeah. Try to encourage my son to do it with me as well. Yeah. Gardening. Mm-hmm. But this is me saying I have absolutely zero green thumb. I yes. kill most of the plants I try to... <laughs> me, I killed the whole garden. <laughs> but they accepted and moved on. Everyone watched me and they were like, oh, okay. I know. Okay. And yeah, but you know, it's the effort you put. Yes. So I tried. I'm like, and it, you know, again, the soil is not the same soil we have here. You know, here yes. you just throw a seed and uh, two days later there's something there yes yeah there it's a bit different and i didn't really know that you know my husband comes and laughs at me trying to you know weed a garden i'm like what is this yes but it's that also got me out of my something that i'm normally you know struggling with so you i read somewhere that you pick a hobby that you know you will suck at yeah so it's not that you're doing the hobby to get better at it it's just for you to engage in something that you've no idea about yeah so I, I tried to do things that I have no clue about, but yes. I'm just going to get in there and see what happens. Yeah. A couple of those things are what I try to apply to myself when yeah. things are really getting intense. Yeah. And they did help me through a couple of very rough times. Mm-hmm. And then the other last thing maybe is to find a trusted outlet. Mm-hmm. So, of course, it gets very, you know, we get very intense and emotional and yeah. like, oh, my God, this thing is consuming me I need yes. to say something <laughs> yes but not everyone will have maybe the context to receive your you know problems yeah, or be able vent. to yeah. yeah so if you're lucky enough to have the one person or the two people you can just like call up and you don't even need to introduce you're like eh, just give me five minutes I need to get this thing off my chest yes that's usually very helpful yeah so definitely a couple of my friends my mom definitely anytime yeah. anytime <laughs> what like, just listen I have this issue and then she'll listen and then she'll be like it doesn't necessarily have to offer advice but it's just yeah. that fact of you have someone on the other side who can totally listen to you without judgment yeah that is something that um I hope people get the opportunity to have. Yeah. But in fellowship, you you should really try and get some someone at someone. least like that because it can get it can get hard. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to your friends and to mom. Yeah. For being open to receive the information and like and from what a few of my relatives have told me, they're like, you know, sometimes we don't fully understand. <laughs> That full conversation, but then just being present yeah, yeah. and letting you just have that safe space goes yeah. such a long way. Yeah. And so a big shout out to them. Yeah. Big, big shout out. And so fast forward to now you're done with the fellowship. So you'd gone from being a consultant, you know, you're a surgeon, you transitioned to a learner uh, and now getting into the headspace of a learner. So how was that transition back from learner? Back to you, now you're the staff, you're the consultant yeah. and, and also transitioning back into the country. Yeah. How was that for you? Well, again, I had a really positive experience mm-hmm. because, again, the other fellowship uh, checkbox thing that you try to do is to be in an institution where you can see people modeling that behavior. Mm. So in the UK, there's a lot of consultants who are already involved in your training. Mm-hmm. So just by doing a clinic with them, then you see, oh, this is how you handle a, a situation that is difficult for a patient. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was direct observership and modeling. So mm-hmm. my my bosses were really excellent in, like, they know Karen has to come and watch. So a lot of the time, you're the fly on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the weird 
just think watching. that a patient is looking at who is that exactly who is that in the corner just <laughs> then, watching us yes. yeah but then they introduce you and you know you have to tell them that this is who i am yeah but your role is just to sit there and observe and mm-hmm. there's a lot to be said for just watching because you don't realize you know because well as surgeons you're just doing things you're used to making decisions and yeah. doing things but there's a lot to be said for just sitting and observing a different style mm-hmm. uh, of handling a situation communicating bad news yeah uh planning treatment mm. um discussing next steps yeah and so ideally in a fellowship you should start with greater responsibility so mm-hmm. at first you're watching then they kind of get a feel of what you're able to do then they put you in more demanding situations yeah. where probably you're the first assistant second assistant or you're doing a clinic next to them mm-hmm. and you can quickly walk in and ask i'm not sure what to do about this and yeah. there shouldn't be any shame because that's your job you're there it is what it is you're yeah. there training you're yeah. not going to do any harm to the patient but yeah. they're overseeing you and then gradually they let you be your own person so yes. they you know it was very gratifying at the point where my boss tells me yeah. you know before before they have to be you know hawk eyed watching every move you make because yes. it is on their name that yeah. you're there with them yeah and then gradually it became oh my boss doesn't even come into the OR he's like i'm just having a coffee if uh, if, if there's me. anything co- that is i'm sure the surgical people will know yes. that is the most um reinforcing positive reinforcement you can get from your boss when your boss is having a coffee when you're in theater. when you're doing the procedure oh, that wow. he's supposed to do so he's yes. they, he or she is so confident that you're able to do it yes and you will you actually you're able to uh verbalize when you're in problems mm. because that is also another technique that you have to be able to learn yes uh enough for them to trust you Mm. to be in that situation by yourself. Okay, it's not um, by yourself, but it's sort of by yourself because yes. you you're going to be making all the decisions yeah. and performing all the all the moves. Yeah. So, a lot of that graded responsibility and it gets to a point where now you're the one who's in charge of, of organizing. So, for example, yeah. if it's a surgical list, yeah. if you have autonomy in mm. saying, "Okay, I've seen these five patients, today yeah. we need to do A B C D E." Yes. We're going to start with this and then we're going to do this and then this other person because of A B C D. So, when you get to that level of autonomy, yeah. because ideally in the UK by the time you finish your training you should yeah. be at the level of a day one consultant meaning when you're given a job yes. as soon as you finish your last day of training you should be able to take on the role of a consultant so mm-hmm. that is always the 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 thrust of the training that yeah. you should get to that point where you're a solo autonomous safe surgeon yes. yeah. so it's a lot more of observing the skills so mm-hmm. that is what gave me the confidence mm-hmm. because this was not a new situation coming back yeah. i'd already been in that position lots of times yes. being tested in different ways mm. and being given direct valuable feedback because mm-hmm. you see that's the other thing sometimes maybe we don't have enough of mm. you 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 have to have someone who's invested with staying with you yes they'll watch you do a clinic or a procedure intervene if it needs to be intervened on And then at the end of the procedure you actually sit down immediately and 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 you know you go through this whole feedback and they ask you okay what what did you feel did went you feel? well yeah and then they'll say okay you could have done this step better next yeah. time you need to do this and this mm. and i got so much of that feedback that now i i could call myself out and i'm like oh i've seen this situation before yeah that helped a lot in my transition back yeah. because now you don't have to worry about the how good am i in mm. this or mm. what do i need to improve you've already got that yeah so when you come It's just a matter of which institution can I attach myself to or what surgical practice or what things yeah. do I need to put in place for me to be effective. Yeah. So having again having a place that is invested in your learning and being able to give you good feedback mm. is is really essential. Is essential. Yeah. And in terms of practice, I know you are heading how do i phrase this you're part of cosexa oh, yeah. and also um the kws huh? kenyan yeah. african women cause, cause. <laughs> I, i was like i don't want to pronounce it the way i am reading it i know because because i don't cows, to get into, yes i don't get so, into so trouble so cows is kenyan association of urological surgeons yes. you know the pronunciation is the same it's as the same. cause kenyan association of women surgeons. surgeons yeah yeah so yeah i mean we're still working out the pronunciation the pronunciation i was like i will just say KWS yeah, until you yeah. so what's your role in that and why is it so important especially with KWS or cause for it to be there yeah and especially now mm. for women so Kenya Association of Women Surgeons is actually a, a initiative of Dr Elizabeth Okemwa she was the founding chair and mm-hmm. she brought together a lot of consultants registrars 
and medical students interested in surgical training. Mm-hmm. At that time, and, and even now, it's still under the umbrella of Surgical Society of Kenya. So that's where we are housed. Mm. And it really seeks to mentor as well as provide uh, learning opportunities to women who are either deep in their surgical field already or mm-hmm. up and coming. Mm-hmm. So we've been successful in a number of ways. We, we hold annual symposiums where we get to share um, each other's experiences as well as have a scientific element to it. Mm-hmm. We also have programs that you know we, we hold within the Surgical Society mandate to also further the interest of women in surgeons mm-hmm. and not to the exclusion of male surgeons because sometimes mm-hmm. a lot of the time people will say, well, if you have cause, why don't you have comes like, yes. you know, for male surgeons? Yeah. But that's not the intent at all. It's because sometimes ladies have um, more unique challenges that if you're not a lady, sometimes you might not be in a position to be an ally to that. So yeah. Dr. Beverly Chasarem is the current chair of cause and mm-hmm. I'm the vice. Mm-hmm. We've probably not been as active as we wanted to be in this coming year due to lots of conflicting reasons. You'll find a lot of people who have these opportunities are having other leadership roles in many other places. So yes. spreading yourself becomes uh, very difficult. Mm-hmm. I am also the co-country representative for COSEXA. So that's mm-hmm. the College of Surgeons of East, Central and Southern Africa. Mm-hmm. We have the most training centers in mm-hmm. all the 14 member wow. countries. It, it is a very growing yeah. uh, field. And uh, myself with Dr. Mother Ngendohio, mm-hmm. we try and uh, foster that <laughs> that uh, training arena. Yeah. So having a couple of those things that I'm additionally doing, yes. it presents a very interesting challenge. Yeah. We're still trying to see how to balance and give our best. Uh, I also have a clinical practice, so I'm still, at the end of the day, I still have to do my job as a breast surgeon. Yeah. So I think even just having the ability to reach out to like-minded people, so not necessarily just women, but people who share your interest in furthering yeah. surgical education or furthering uh, breast care and creating that community is mm-hmm. something that's very, very important to me. And yes. I'm doing my best to see how, how I can be effective yeah. while I'm here. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Can anyone join either KWS or be able to attend the symposiums? Is it open to all women in the medical field? Yeah. I'm asking because like now me, I'm a pediatrician. <laughs> I'm not about to pick up a knife, but I'm no, very curious no, to yeah. see what that sort of environment is like yeah. you know, in a symposium setting. So yeah. would I be able to come with someone who's a medical student yeah. be able to attend? Yeah. Primarily, actually, a lot of our participants tend to be medical students Mm -hmm. who are thinking about joining the surgical fraternity. Mm -hmm. Because as you rightly said before, surgery, you know, automatically comes with this image of a big burly man who is like, you know, looks a certain way. And it can't be this, you know, lady who just looks like your ordinary mom. And so a lot of that mystification of do I really have what it takes to train in surgery Mm. is what draws uh, medical students to come and hear from people who've done it or Mm. who are doing it. Like Mm. from, in my experience, being able to see someone like Dr. Lois Kahoro, by that time she was the only lady in general surgery. Of course, there are lots of other colleagues in uh, ENT, uh, ophthalmology, um, obsgyn, and other mm-hmm. surgical fields. But mm-hmm. to me, general surgery, I hadn't seen any woman. You'd only seen her. And I'd only seen her. There wow. was also another lady who uh, uh, relocated. She was actually truly the first lady to train. So Dr. Mm-hmm. Faith, Dr. Andoga, she relocated to Australia. Yeah. But for us growing up in medical school, we didn't know anyone else that apart from her. That was the only person. Yeah. Yes. So actually, increasingly right? we're yeah. like, well, okay, so for, for me it's gen surg. Now I could imagine some people who are interested in orthopedic surgery, yes. in neurology, typically male-dominated fields, vascular, yeah. neurosurgery. And now if I tell you the number of people who are like, off the top of my head, I can yeah. name four female neurosurgeons. Wow. I can name like five plus orthopedic yeah. surgeons. Yes. Three urologists, all women. Yeah. And before, maybe like seven years ago, I wouldn't be able to do that. And I think it's right. partly because of having somebody you can see mm. that, oh, Kumbe, you can be a woman and still do this. Yeah. Something that probably we, sh- we should be a lot further in discussing in 2024, but yes. hey, yeah. here we are um, talking about gender and, and performance of duties. <laughs> performance of duties. Yeah, but I think we, we still have that need. So a lot of, mm. yes, to answer your question, a lot of ladies who are medical students, both men and women actually, yeah. are welcome to join. Usually we 
put out on social media and say, okay, this is where the symposium is going to be. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we have a function or a lunch on e- within the Surgical Society Conference, which tends to happen in mid-April. Yeah. So they can also join us if they're yeah. in that event. Around the same time as, as Kenya Pediatrics Peds, Yeah, we're always with PEDS, guys. <laughs> yes. Now I know. Yeah. Just sneak out of the PEDS come, conference come, come. and we, attend. We, we welcome everyone. Yes, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Do you see why I started by introducing you as Wonder Woman. I don't know. Do you understand? <laughs> Let me tell you, as in... I'm just Karen. I oh mean, honestly, I, I sometimes I look back and I'm like, hey, is this is this me? Is this, <sighs> is this me? But uh, there's a purpose to everything. And I thank God I've actually seen some of the things that I had hoped for myself yeah. coming to fruition. So yeah. yeah. And for those of us who are, you know, on the sidelines just observing and watching and like we were saying earlier, like you've you've been a step ahead of me in medical school and I've always known you from a distance. So even just getting a sneak peek into what your life has been like has been an honor and a privilege. And I thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience, to give us your nuggets. There's so many, like I'll see myself listening <laughs> to this over and over again. I'm just like, oh, ooh, that's another nugget, you know, Aww. and putting it down. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do you have a parting shot for any person out there who's thinking about breast surgery as a subspecialty or even thinking about surgery as a whole do you have a parting shot for this person out there who's listening being like what am I going to do where do I start yeah Mm -hmm. well I think if God put it in your heart you can do it I love it so you've had it if God put it in your heart You can do it. And with that, I thank you all for taking the time to listen to us, to get on this safari with us as we listened and learned about breast surgery and the experience it has been from the UK perspective and reflecting on what's happened back here in Kenya. We hope to be able to interact with a lot of the feedback that you may have. We'll put a way that you can be able to reach Dr. Mbabu, an email address that in case you have any further questions, please please feel free to be able to ask her directly. But then also on the socials and also on email, please reach out to us. We really want to hear what you have to say about this episode. And until next time, bye everyone. Bye. I'm so glad you stayed tuned. Please get the word out and share it with at least three people. Make this episode like a chain letter. Share it, share it, share it. Come back for the next leg of our safari where we'll be talking about... With every interaction we have with the patient, try and learn as much as possible. Learn about the patient. The human beings are infinitely interesting. Mm. I've not met a human being who I do not want to know more about. Everyone has a story. Everyone has something fascinating about them. And that's what makes this profession of ours such a privilege. Listeners are advised to use their own judgment and discretion when applying any information discussed in this and all podcast episodes to their specific situation. Always seek the advice of a qualified professional if you have any concerns or questions regarding a particular subject matter. You can find this and other episodes of this podcast on our website at www.fellowshipsafaris.org. You can also find all our episodes on all podcast platforms. Reach out to us on social media as Fellowship Safaris on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. And our Twitter handle is at Fellowships Afar. You could also send us an email on fellowshipsafaris at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you and interacting with what you have to say about the Fellowship Safaris podcast. It takes a village to make this podcast. The executive producer and original music is done by Mokavi Maweu. The sound engineer is Tevin Sudi with thanks to AQ Studios. Graphic design was done by Benjamin Mboya. We would like to give a special shout out to Josephine Karianjahe and Melissa Mbogwa of Africa Podfest. All rights reserved by Dr. Jerry Karianjahe and the Fellowship Safaris podcast.